All across the world tonight, um, Christians will be commemorating the Last Supper, uh, commemorating what's known as Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday. And it's at the end of the Last Supper, uh, after Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples, uh, that he says to them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the challenge uh, for us this morning uh, and in the days and weeks and years ahead, uh, is how to love one another, uh, especially as we are in the midst of what's been called a transgender moment. How do we love those who are struggling with their gender identity? How do we love those who identify as transgender? And one of the things that we know from Jesus is that love is intimately connected to truth. And so it's tomorrow when Christians all across the globe commemorate Good Friday uh, that we'll recall Pilate's words uh, during that trial and during that execution. Truth. What is truth? Jesus tells us that he is the way and the truth and the life. He tells us that he came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He told us that we will know the truth and that the truth will set us free. And so as we think this morning about some of the claims being made about gender identity, about the human person, about transgender identities, those are the two concepts um, that I would urge us to keep in mind. Um, The commandment we have is to love one another and that love is intimately connected with truth, a truth that sets us free. Why do I preface this? It's because we can go wrong in either of those directions. We can overemphasize love detached from truth so that it becomes something saccharine, so that it becomes something more like appeasement or affirmation or simply giving people what they want, or letting them hear what they want to hear. If you detach love from truth, it becomes inauthentic. But so too, we can proclaim the truth and defend the truth in a way that's disconnected from love, uh, where the truth becomes uh, something that we hit people over the heads with, uh, where the truth becomes more about our own egos, uh, our own desire to be right. Uh, The truth becomes a weapon. Uh, It ceases to be loving. And so the challenge for us is how do we put those two things together? How do we connect both truth and love? Because that's the only way that it will actually be authentic and meaningful. Right now, what we're hearing in our culture um, is that a boy can be trapped in a girl's body. That our sex is merely assigned to us at birth. That modern medicine can reassign sex. And that the most loving and helpful response to someone struggling with their gender identity, someone experiencing gender dysphoria, is to transition, either through hormones or surgery, to live as if the opposite sex. But are these claims true? And is that response loving? To a certain extent, these shouldn't be difficult questions. In the late 1970s, Dr. Paul McHugh thought he had convinced the vast majority of his professional colleagues not to go along with bold claims that were being made uh, first back in the 60s and 70s about gender identity. Uh, McHugh had received a world-class education first at Harvard College as an undergraduate, then at Harvard Medical School. And then in the 70s, he became the chair of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, the chair of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Medical School, and the psychiatrist-in-chief at Johns Hopkins Hospital. So he was now responsible for all psychiatric care at those institutions. And back in the 60s, Johns Hopkins had opened a sex reassignment clinic. It was the first to do so. And so McHugh asked one of his colleagues to conduct a study. Uh, They had been reassigning people's sex for a decade. What was the outcome? And he found that while the patients were happy with the surgery as a cosmetic matter, it hadn't brought the wholeness and the happiness that they were seeking. Um, The struggles that brought them to Johns Hopkins in the first place, struggles with anxiety and with depression, with substance abuse, with alcohol abuse, with suicide ideation, with suicide attempts, uh, sadly, even with completed suicides, those persisted. Uh, They weren't being improved. And so back in 1979, 
Dr. McHugh had Hopkins shut down the sex reassignment clinic. And many other institutions followed the lead once Johns Hopkins, this elite medical center, uh, set this precedent. But recent years have seen a renewal of sex reassignment procedures. Uh, just a decade ago, back in 2007, Boston Children's Hospital became, as its website brags, quote, the first major program in the United States to focus on transgender children and adolescents. A decade later, uh, so today, there are now 45 pediatric gender clinics uh, where parents are told that unless they give their child puberty-blocking drugs and cross-sex hormones, their child may commit suicide. Never mind that the best studies of gender dysphoria uh, show that somewhere between 80 to 95% of children who struggle with their gender identity will naturally grow out of that stage and will reconcile with their body if their development is allowed to continue. Uh, never mind that adults who identify as transgender, 41% of them attempt suicide at some point in their lives. Never mind that people who have had the sex reassignment surgery are 19 times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. These statistics um, are tragic, and they should stop us in our tracks, and they should stop the culture uh, from the headlong rush uh, to be embracing uh, transgender identities and transgender medicine. What I argue um, in the book, uh, and what I want to kind of summarize a little bit this morning in chapel, um, is that Dr. McHugh got it right back in the 70s. Uh, human nature hasn't changed in the past 40 years, and that the realities that Dr. McHugh was pointing to in 79 when Hopkins shut down the sex climate uh, clinic are still realities today. Uh, the best biology, the best psychology, the best philosophy, they all support an understanding of sex as a bodily reality and then of gender as a social manifestation of sex. Biology isn't bigotry. And unfortunately, there are very... Um, there are very real human costs to getting human nature wrong. And so the challenge for us is, how do we respond in both truth and love to prevent some of those human costs uh, in our own cultural moment? So I want to start with um, some comments to help you understand this transgender moment uh, and then conclude with how we should respond to the transgender moment because that's our calling here, is we have to first understand what's going on so then we can respond. Um, people claim that we live in a postmodern age that has rejected metaphysics, um, but that's actually not quite true. Uh, we live in a postmodern age that proposes an alternative metaphysic. And at the heart of the transgender moment are radical claims about the human person. It's radical claims about the human person and the human body and human identity. And the claim here is that uh, someone who identifies as transgender is the sex with which they identify. The claim is no longer that it's a boy who identifies as a girl or a man who identifies as a woman. Uh, the claim now is that the transgender woman is a woman, not a man who identifies as a woman. And it's understandable why activists would make that sort of a claim. A claim about who someone is is much more effective and persuasive in our society than a claim about how someone identifies. An identity claim, who you are, is more uh, powerful than how you choose to identify. But the activists, they don't want to um, have this discussion on the level of philosophy, of metaphysics and anthropology, because in our culture, the high priests aren't the philosophers and the theologians. In our culture, the high priests are the scientists and the doctors. So they dress up a philosophical claim as if it's a medical and scientific claim. And then they use the authority of science and medicine to make radical assertions about anthropology and about human nature. And so I'm, I, have, I have some quotes that I want to share with you, and I put them up on PowerPoint just so you can read along. Um, just because some of them are, are lengthy quotes. And so the first one I want to read to you, it's from a, a doctor at Duke University's medical school. And she's the director 
of the Duke Center for Child and Adolescent Gender Care, uh, which opened two and a half years ago. It opened back in 2015. And this is one of those 45 pediatric gender clinics. And Dr. Adkins, uh, she was testifying uh, an expert declaration in a federal court in North Carolina. Uh, and this is what she said. From a medical perspective, the appropriate determinant of sex is gender identity. It is counter to medical science to use chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics to override gender identity for purposes of classifying someone as male or female. Now, this is a remarkable claim that an expert witness is making in a federal court uh, for at least two reasons. The first is that historically, the word gender, as it was originally uh, used uh, in the context of human persons rather than in the context of grammar, uh, about 50 years ago, it was introduced in contradistinction to sex. Uh, the original people who used the word gender to refer to people said sex is a bodily biological reality, but gender is a social construct. Two generations later, the argument now is that gender identity determines the sex of an individual. A generation ago, the bread and butter of medical science was chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics. Today, it's counter to medical science to rely on any of those objective realities of the human person and the human body if they conflict with someone's identity. Uh, that's the argument that's being advanced uh, by the activists in courtrooms. But it's also taking place in classrooms. Uh, and some of you are probably young enough to be familiar with the next two slides that I'm going to show. So the gender-bred person uh, is being used in classrooms across the United States right now to help catechize children into how they should think about their own identity. Uh, and if you look at the gender-bred person, you'll see that up in the brain area, they have gender identity, which they define as how you in your head define your gender, based on how you align or don't align with what you understand to be the options for gender. And then in that upper right-hand corner, you see those four blue boxes. Uh, it's too small for you to read where you're seated, so I'll read to you. It lists, quote, four of infinite possibilities. And the four of infinite that they list are womanness, manness, two-spirit, and genderqueer. And all of those things exist along a spectrum. And so you see those arrows there, the arrow of where do you fall along the spectrum of womanness or manness or two-spirit or genderqueer. That's your gender identity, but then the entire gender-bred person has an arrow that talks about gender expression. And gender expression is, quote, the way you present gender through your actions, dress, and demeanor. And the graphic lists six possibilities here, feminine or masculine, butch or femme, androgynous or gender neutral. Then it has biological sex, and then at the bottom it has two components for orientation, uh, both sexually attracted to and romantic, romantically attracted to. And school children are being taught um, that these five characteristics of their identity need not have any relation to one another. That your gender identity and gender expression need not be related to your biological sex. That your romantic attractions and your sexual attractions need not be related to your biological sex. And your gender identity and expression need not be related to your sexual and romantic attractions. Uh, students have to um, identify and construct their identity on all of these spectrums. This is the new background script. Rather than the background script being something like um, male and female, he created them. And for this reason, a man leaves his mother and father and clings to his wife, and the two become what, one flesh, and what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Rather than that being the background script uh, uh, against which students will interpret their own lives, their own experiences, their own emotions, their feelings, this will be the new background script. Students won't be catechized according to the Westminster Catechism or the Baltimore Catechism. It'll be the gender-bred person, uh, which means it's more likely when a student experiences a gender identity conflict that they interpret it not according to Genesis, but according to the gender-bred person. 
But actually, the genderbred person is now out of date. Even though um, the slide here is the most recent, most up-to-date version of this, version 3.3, you can see at the top. The genderbred person has been criticized for two reasons. Uh, the first is that the genderbred person looks too much like a man. It looks like a gingerbread man. And so the genderbred person has been criticized for contributing to the patriarchy. <laughs> the second reason is that if you look in the middle of the genderbred person, in the pelvic area, it says biological sex. And that is now politically incorrect. That's now out of date. So the new graphic is the gender unicorn. <laughs> and what you'll see is that you now have something in the middle of the graphic called sex assigned at birth. No longer is sex a biological reality. It was merely assigned to you at birth, and therefore it can be reassigned to you. Right? So school children are being taught that maybe your sex was uh, improperly assigned at birth, and you're actually the other sex, and so therefore you could take hormones or have surgery to reassign your sex. It's also worth pointing out that the gender unicorn, um, it's a unicorn, a mythical creature. It's appropriate here. They, they tried to get away from the genderbred person because it looked too much like a man. They went for a unicorn. It's intentionally purple. It looks like Barney. It's meant to be attractive and appealing to young children. It's meant to be catechizing children in how they should think about their own identity. Given the transgender worldview, uh, what I call in the book transgender ontology, what they believe to be the truth about the human person, that then gives rise to the medicine, uh, the medical protocol. And so I want to mention a four-part standard of care on how the gender experts think people should be treated. Uh, they say first there should be a social transition for a child as young as two or three or four years old um, they can know their real gender identity, and it's no less authentic than the gender identity of an older child or of an adult. And so young children should be given a new name, a new pronoun, a new wardrobe, and access to new bathrooms and locker rooms uh, to affirm their real gender identity. Then as the child approaches puberty, they should be prevented from going through puberty in the, quote, wrong body. And so doctors are prescribing puberty-blocking drugs to indefinitely block uh, pubertal development in children who identify as the opposite sex. Uh, these drugs are not FDA-approved for this purpose. Uh, they're being used off-label. They were tested and FDA-approved for treating a condition known as precocious puberty, uh, where puberty starts too early in life. And doctors would prescribe this medicine to delay puberty to an age-appropriate time. Now they're using this drug off-label to indefinitely delay puberty, so a child will never go through the development that's appropriate uh, for his or her body. Which then leads to the third um, stage of the four-part protocol, because now you have a 14, 15, 16-year-old who hasn't matured, who hasn't developed, uh, where all of his or her classmates have hit their growth spurt have gone through puberty, their bones have, densened, uh, have lengthened, the density has increased, uh, they've, they're starting to mature sexually as either a man or a woman. This individual has not. So the third step is to try to um, mimic the opposite sex's puberty with the administration of the opposite sex's sex hormone. Uh, so teenage girls will be administered testosterone to masculinize their bodies. Teenage boys will be administered estrogen to feminize their bodies. And then the fourth and the final step of this treatment protocol, at age 18, uh, these teenagers are then eligible for reassignment surgeries. Uh, and this could include um, either or both of top and or bottom surgery. Uh, what these surgeries, I go through in detail in the book, I'll, be more cursory here, but what the surgeries entail are, are the removal of external um, uh, uh, genitalia, external secondary sex characteristics, in some cases internal reproductive organs, and then the cosmetic um, surgical creation of secondary sex characteristics and genitalia that try to 
um, resemble the opposite sex's uh, body parts. From the uh, transgender ontology and the transgender medicine comes the transgender public policy. And I just want to highlight four aspects of that um, so you can know what's going on. Uh, the first are the lessons that will be taught in schools. Um, will your local school, will your local school district be teaching children that the gender unicorn is the truth about the human person? Uh, will your future children uh, be indoctrinated to believe that their gender identity, their gender expression, their sex assigned at birth, their physical attractions and their emotional attractions um, are things that all exist along spectrums and that they have to decide for themselves, that there are no givens to human nature, uh, that everything is something that will be socially constructed. Uh, the second aspect of the policy is what will be the policy when it comes to sex-specific facilities? Will we do locker rooms and shower facilities and bathrooms and sports teams based upon biology and the biological differences, the bodily differences between boys and girls, men and women, or will we do it based upon gender identity? The third are various um, speech codes, um, whether or not you could be penalized for using the wrong pronouns. In New York City, you can uh, be fined up to a quarter million dollars for intentionally misgendering someone. Uh, Canada has a similar law. That's how Jordan Peterson first came to uh, national prominence. Was he's a professor at Canada who said he wasn't going to go along with the new pronoun policing in Canada. And then lastly, the provision of medical services. Uh, will doctors have to perform sex reassignment procedures? Will healthcare plans have to cover them? Will this university have to cover sex reassignment procedures in its healthcare plan? Uh, everything that you saw several years ago with uh, abortion and contraception coverage was repeated in 2016 in a mandate under Obamacare that said all healthcare plans have to cover reassignment procedures and all relevant physicians have to perform them. Uh, thankfully, that mandate was struck down by a federal judge and the current administration uh, hasn't uh, reissued that mandate. But a future administration might, and so we have to be concerned about these policies. So what to think of this? Um, the first thing to say is that the transgender worldview uh, is internally incoherent. It makes radical claims that are contradictory with each other. Uh, and so I'm trained in, in philosophy, and so where I want to start in, in the how to understand and how to respond part of this is thinking through these underlying anthropological claims. And hopefully this will be helpful when you discuss these issues uh, with your friends, with your classmates, with your family members. Because the transgender worldview, it combines a new form of the ancient philosophy of Gnosticism in which the real self is something other than a material body while simultaneously embracing materialism in which nothing but material bodies exist. So that first contradiction there, uh, many of these activists are materialists, only physical matter exists, but the real self is something other than the physical body in a new form of Gnostic dualism. The transgender worldview, it relies on rigid sex stereotypes in which girls play with dolls and boys play with trucks. Yet it insists that gender is a purely social construct and thus there are no meaningful differences between man and woman, all the while insisting that gender identity is real and meaningful, but human embodiment is not. And if you want to see how it relies on sex stereotypes, think of that cover uh, um, image of Caitlyn Jenner. It became, uh, it, it, it showed a quintessential uh, pinup. Uh, Bruce became Caitlyn in what was uh, a kind of a very stereotypical way of what a seductive woman is supposed to look like. But being a woman isn't just high heels and fingernail polish and red lipstick and cleavage. It relies on sex stereotypes through and through as it identifies who's a man, who's a woman, who's a boy, who's a girl. And then lastly, uh, it embraces a radical expressive individualism 
where people should be free to do what they want to do and to define the truth how they wish it to be defined, but it also enforces a ruthless paternalism uh, to coerce anyone who would dare dissent from transgender ideology. So I want to run through a series of questions that you can ask yourselves and that you can put to your friends. If gender is a social construct, how can gender identity be innate and immutable? That is, how can one's identity with respect to a social construct be determined by biology in the womb? And how can one's identity be, identity be unchangeable, be immutable, with respect to an ever-changing social construct? And so the challenge to anyone who embraces a transgender worldview is to give a meaningful definition of gender and gender identity that's detached from the human body. And I haven't seen anyone who's been able to do that. Another series of questions. What does it even mean to have a, quote, internal sense of gender? What does gender feel like? Apart from a body, what meaning can we give to the concept of gender and gender identity? And thus, what internal sense can we have of gender? To put this even more concretely, apart from having a male body, what does it feel like to be a man? Apart from having a female body, what does it feel like to be a woman? Or even more pointedly, what does it feel like to be both a man and a woman? Or to be neither? Remember, these things exist along a spectrum, and you can be a man, a woman, both, neither, or something else. What would that feeling feel like? Then there are some ontological questions. Those were epistemological, questions about knowledge. Ontological, questions about being. Why should feeling like a man, whatever that means, make you a man? That is, why do our feelings determine reality when it comes to our sexual identity, where they don't determine reality on anything else? Our feelings don't determine our age or our height. And very few are the people who went along with Rachel Dolezal the white woman who feels like a black woman. Uh, we don't say she's transracial. We don't say her identity as African-American therefore determines that she is African-American. What about people who identify um, as trans species or people who identify as trans-abled? Well, none of these identities have we said that the identity determines reality. What we have said instead is that we want to help people align their thoughts and their feelings with their bodily reality. So to a certain extent, gender identity can sound like religious identity. Um, and what I mean by that are identities that are determined by beliefs. But just like religion, our beliefs don't determine reality. Someone who identifies as a Christian believes that Jesus is the Christ. Someone who identifies as a Muslim believes that Muhammad is the prophet. But Jesus either is or is not the Christ, regardless of what any of us believe. And in the same way, someone either is or is not a man, regardless of what anyone, including that individual, believes. And so just as in the religious life, the entire point of prayer and discernment and evangelism is to conform our thoughts and our beliefs and our life to the truth, so too when it comes to our identity and our gender identity. It's not to transform external reality in accordance with our beliefs and our thoughts and our feelings, but to align our beliefs and our thoughts and our feelings to reality. So just as it's true in religious life, so too in our uh, sexual and gender lives. The um, research that I did on this topic that was most difficult to conduct uh, was a chapter on people who had transitioned and then detransitioned. Um, and their stories are heartbreaking because they didn't find the wholeness and the happiness that they were looking for. Uh, and the stories of, um, uh, they're known as detransitioners. Their stories, they complicate the kind of sunny narrative uh, that the media would present. Uh, many of these individuals report feeling pressured 
to transition. Uh, the, the doctors and the gender therapists presented transitioning as their only option. Many wish that the medical experts would have discussed with them other potential underlying causes of their dysphoria and other potential solutions. Many of them, they regret the permanent damage uh, that has been done to their bodies. Uh, many of them feel that they transitioned much too young. Uh, they weren't in a position to be making such life-altering decisions. And some of them report that it's people like me, and by extension, some people like you, uh, that are partly responsible for this. Uh, they point out that it's social conservatives, it's the religious right um, that stigmatized people like them with overly rigid sex stereotypes, with overly rigid gender roles. And because they didn't fit into those stereotypes or those gender roles, uh, that contributed to their gender dysphoria. And because the church wasn't a welcoming environment, they didn't feel comfortable uh, reaching out to the church for help, and they felt comfortable going to the gender clinic. And so that should immediately caution us um, to always be sure to unite that truth and that love in how we discuss these issues and how we respond to people who are in need. I want to read you just um, a couple of quotes. I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides um, to get to uh, uh, the appropriate uh, quote here. And it comes from a uh, video that one uh, young woman made, uh, Carrie. She says, this is a YouTube video, you can find it online. You have the, the, the title of it at the bottom there. She says, I was put on hormones after three months of therapy at the age of 17. In fact, because I was only seeing a therapist once per month, it was after three or four visits that I was prescribed testosterone. With no meaningful attempt made to process the issues that I brought up that led in part to my wish to transition. When I was transitioning, no one in the medical or psychological field ever tried to dissuade me to offer other options, to do really anything to stop me besides tell me I should wait till I was 18. I want to ask you, how many other medical conditions are there where you can walk into the doctor's office, tell them that you have a certain condition, which has no objective test, which can be caused by trauma or mental health issues or societal factors, and receive life-altering medications on your say-so? In another video, uh, Carrie says, I think the prospect of completely changing your body your life, your identity, is very compelling to a teenager who is just learning to cope with mental health issues, with trauma, with gender nonconformance, with being a lesbian. And that's especially true when the current rhetoric around transition really discourages any kind of questioning. It really frames transitioning or trans identity as a solution to any kind of gender issue or gender confusion. And I think it's really important for therapists not to frame transition as the only solution, to really present options and to encourage people not to take their feelings and urges entirely at face value, to be critical, to really think about where those thoughts are coming from. And then finally, I wanted to make a video previously so that folks can see that I'm a real live person, but I didn't out of fear of showing my face. But I think it's important when we talk about these issues to really understand that women like us aren't just statistics, not just some dry data some gatekeeping doctor might throw at you. We're real people. This is a real outcome of transition. I'm a real live 22-year-old woman with a scarred chest and a broken voice and five o'clock shadow because I couldn't face the idea of growing up to be a woman. That's my reality. And so the challenge for us um, is how many other people will report five years after going on testosterone that this is their reality? Uh, what will we do uh, that will either uh, make these struggles worse or make them better? Uh, what is the role that we can play uh, to help fee people feel comfortable in their own bodies uh, as God created them male or female? Uh, what can we do to help people develop a more nuanced understanding of gender that doesn't rely on sex stereotypes uh, so that people don't think that they must be a boy trapped in a girl's body because they don't uh, identify with every of the stereotypical ways in which, quote, good girls are supposed to behave, or vice versa. Uh, let me close with um, uh, two clinical examples that I discuss in the book. 
One involves uh, a young boy who was identifying as a girl, and his parents uh, brought him to a clinic uh, to see a therapist. And in the course of talk therapy, the clinician identified that this young boy was being bullied by the other boys in his class. They were calling him a wuss and a weenie because he wasn't the stereotypical masculine, macho, rough and tumble boy. As a way of coping with his bullying, uh, the boy had developed close friendships with the girls in his class. And his interests were now more stereotypically girly. And so he had, as a way of coping with the bullying, Ident uh, convinced himself that he was actually a girl trapped in a boy's body. And so the therapist suggested three things for the parents to do. One, remove your child from this toxic environment uh, because of the bullying that's contributing to your child's gender dysphoria. Two, keep bringing your child to see me so we can keep discussing what it really means to be a boy. Uh, that your child doesn't have to be distressed at the idea of being a boy because he has too narrow of an understanding of what it means to be a boy and what it means to develop into a man. Uh, we need to help him develop a more mature and nuanced understanding of masculinity. Um, so often it's based on very limited and stereotypical understandings of gender that lead to the gender dysphoria. And then lastly, the therapist said, it's not enough to just talk to your son about these things. He needs to experience it. A young boy, they're not cognitively mature enough to have robust gender theories. They need lived experience. You need to find your son a peer group of boys like him so that he can make friendships with other boys like him so he won't have anxiety about being a boy, so he won't have to think that being a girl is his only path to happiness. After the parents did this, uh, their child was readily identifying as a boy again after a year or so. In another example, uh, a child was talking to a therapist, identifying as a girl, a young boy identifying as a girl. When the therapist said, what is it about being a boy that you find uncomfortable? What is it about being a girl that you find attractive? The child said, mommies love little girls more than they love little boys. So the therapist said, something's going on, not with the child, but with the family structure. And so the therapist started meeting one-on-one -on -one with the mother, uh, and she revealed that she had been raped earlier in life, and she never received the healing and the wholeness that she needed. And as a result of her sexual assault, she had developed an antipathy towards men, an aversion towards men. She had two children, a son and a daughter, and she couldn't be as affectionate with her son as she could with her daughter. And her son was subconsciously picking up on this. And he was identifying as a girl as a way of trying to curry his mother's affection. And so what the therapist did here was he started working one-on-one -on -one with the mother to provide her with the healing and the wholeness that she needed so she could then be fully affectionate and loving and caring with her son. A year after this, the son's readily identifying as a boy again. In both of these cases, these young children were spared uh, from going on puberty-blocking drugs, from receiving estrogen, from having surgery, from one day making a video uh, like Carrie had to do. And so the challenge for us is, uh, what can we do um, to help present the truth about the human person uh, in a charitable and accessible way to people who might not share all of our underlying convictions, uh, to people who might not share all of our beliefs? How can we speak in a language that'll be accessible to others uh, and that it'll be obvious that we're coming from a perspective of genuine care and concern? Um, so with that, we're out of time. Uh, so let me uh, close us in prayer, uh, and then you guys can get on to your next class. Father, we thank you for uh, the gift of our lives and of our bodies uh, and of our identities, uh, created male and female and created for each other. Uh, we ask you to help us to bear witness to the truth and to do so in a loving uh, and charitable way. Uh, we ask you to be with us this weekend as we commemorate your son's uh, passion and death and resurrection, uh, we ask you to send your spirit to be in our lives so that we can be better witnesses uh, to the truth of your son's passion and resurrection and to the truth of the human person made in the image and likeness of your triune God. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.